Hello, Crusaders. Wherever you may be zooming in from, I want to welcome you to today's historical tour of our beloved Holy Cross, titled Hidden, Virtually in Plain Sight. My name is Tom Cadigan. I serve as the Associate Director in the Office of Alumni Relations, and I am also a very proud member of the class of 2002. Now, I majored in history served as a tour guide through the admissions office during my undergraduate years, and in the category of other duties as assigned, I currently offer a walking tour of campus a handful of times each year through the college's human resources office to all new hires of Holy Cross. Now, do I consider myself a campus expert? No, but this is certainly a topic near and dear to my heart. Now, today, we'll be together for just about an hour. I encourage you to use the chat function located on your toolbar to communicate with your fellow participants. You're also welcome to submit questions throughout the tour using the Q&A function also on your toolbar. I will set aside time at the end to try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Now, one more housekeeping point. I tried to format this tour in a fun, informative, and interactive way. Now, while it certainly doesn't take the place of a true in-person tour where you can actually see and maybe feel the Holy Cross sites, we'll do our best to replicate under the current virtual and time constraints. This will be fun though. All right, so we'll begin with this tour's true architect, the late Father Tony Kuznevsky. Father K, as many affectionately called him, was a beloved faculty member in the college's history department for several decades. He was also a longtime athletic chaplain and friend to numerous students, alumni, and families. He sadly passed away in 2016, but his memory certainly lives on. Now, Father K literally wrote the book on Holy Cross, which was published in 1994, titled Thy Honored Name, A History of the College of the Holy Cross. And Father K is proudly holding a copy of the book in the photo on the right. Now, Father K developed the framework for this tour as a way to educate students about the college and the campus they call home during their four years on Mount St. James. Now, many of us, even as alumni and parents, walk past buildings, statues, and other campus objects and may not know A, what they are, and B, how they relate to Holy Cross's history. This tour aims to educate and expand our collective horizons and to deepen our love for Alma Mater. So, in the spirit of Father K, who was a true teacher at heart, I want to start with a pop quiz. Now, don't worry, this won't be graded. We're not going to revoke your degrees. I certainly don't have the power to do that. Um, but I'm going to put a question up, and I want you to do your best to answer it. How many acres comprise the Holy Cross campus? We'll take a few seconds. How many acres comprise the Holy Cross campus? I'll give it another couple of seconds. Get some good answers coming in. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Good responses. Let's see, 44% of you, the majority, say 174 acres. We've got a few who say 226. Well, I'll be honest, this was a little bit of a trick question. Um, I'll stop sharing. The correct answer, 226, as of 2016, when Holy Cross opened the Joyce Contemplative Center in West Boylston, Massachusetts. Um, prior to that, kind of the, the one College Street address, 
um, is 174 acres. But with the addition of the contemplative center, um, it added another 50 or so acres. If you haven't had a chance to visit that new facility, it is beautiful. There's a aerial view of it on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. Um, it's located about 20 minutes away um, from the Worcester campus, um, located on a beautiful hill overlooking the Wachusett Reservoir. Um, but it is absolutely beautiful. And actually every year, the uh, college chaplain's office um, offer retreats for alumni. Um, so if you have the opportunity, um, please take advantage of it. Um, but if you consider the Holy Cross campus is almost like the map of the U.S., the contiguous U.S. is, uh, is our one College Street address with 174 acres. But now the uh, Contemplative Center is kind of like our Alaska and Hawaii, which has expanded the footprint a little more. Um, now, rather than structure this tour chronologically, I'm going to take a page from Father Kay's tour experience and organize it a little spatially as though we're walking around campus together. Now, since this is virtual and the many hills and steps of Mount St. James aren't a factor, I figured we could start at the bottom of the hill and work our way up. So here we go. The bottom of the hill, the Blackstone River. Um, you know, the, the picture on the bottom is, is one that I took from Google Earth. Um, today, the Blackstone is something you can easily walk past or drive past. Um, between the, uh, the Southbridge Street, Route 12, or the on-ramp to 290, it can seem a little bit buried. Um, but it does form the northern boundary of campus. And the picture um, on the left was probably dated to about the 1870s or the 1880s. We know that because that's Fenwick Hall at the top of the hill, um, and O'Kane is not there. Construction for O'Kane began in the 1890s. Um, but I picked this photo, I like it, because it really shows the Blackstone River, um, what it was compared to kind of what we see today when we're visiting campus. Um, and the Blackstone begins its trek to Rhode Island right at the foot of Mount St. James. Um, and this little river, or so it seems to us, um, walking around campus, actually has some significance. It's considered the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution um, because the new nation's first textile mill, a watered power cotton spinning factory, was actually built along its banks down the river in Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 1790. Um, so this little river um, that kind of makes up the northern boundary of our beloved campus um, has some significance. Um, and it's played some significant role in the college's history as well. Um, one example, in 1852, so a little less than a decade after Holy Cross was founded, um, there was a devastating fire of Fenwick Hall, which at that point pretty much was the central building on campus. Um, the, fi the fire started small, but um, engulfed the building very, very quickly. And local firefighters, um, in order to fight that blaze, had to use a series of hoses and pumping engines from the Blackstone River in order to get that fire out. Now, if you know Holy Cross, we're built on a hill. So to put together that hose and pumping apparatus, it took a little time. It took a little over an hour. Um, and that time devastated Fenwick Hall and was essentially burnt to the ground as a result. Um, we'll get a little bit more into Fenwick later on. Um, but I just wanted to share that story because it just paints how the Blackstone River um, and Holy Cross's history really do intertwine. Um, Moving a little higher up the hill, this is a familiar spot for many of you. Fit and Field opened its gates in 1905, um, named after Father James Fitton, the original um, owner of the land who sold Mount St. James to, uh, to Bishop Fenwick and became Holy Cross. Um, it, it was opened in the early part of the 20th century and has kind of served as 
the, uh, the athletic center of the college. Um, there's been many, uh, uh, an important game, many a very famous student athlete who's competed on these fields. Um, you know, you, you think of the 1952 um, College World Series baseball team, still to this day, um, the only um, New England school to capture that, uh, that, that national prize. Um, you know, on the gridiron, you think of someone like Vince Permuto, Holy Cross class of 60, um, went on to a very esteemed NFL career and is now in the ring of fame for the Washington Redskins. Um, you think of someone like Gordy Lockbaum, Holy Cross class of 88, a Heisman Trophy finalist for football. Um, the, the, picture on the, um, the picture on the left was taken in the early 60s, maybe mid 60s, the picture on the right um, in the early 90s. Um, but did you know that Fitton Field is not the first athletic field at the college? Um, and, and I want to delve into that a little bit more. This very interesting aerial, um, which we think is from around the year 1918, right around the time of the First World War. It's the oldest aerial of the campus that, that we know of. Um, you know, you could see Fenwick Hall right here with the spires. Um, we've got O'Kane. Um, this is Alumni Hall. This is Bevan. Um, but the rest is, is pretty much either fields or pastures or just open space. Um, Fit and Field is at the bottom of the hill right here. Um, but that was built again in, in 1905. And this, uh, this photo is dated around 1918. But I want to point out right in the middle, you'll see a baseball field, um, right where the present day um, um, Kimball, um, Stein Hall, Carlin Hall, right there, almost a tier below um, Fenwick Hall, there's a baseball field. Um, and it was actually put in place around the same time that O'Kane was built. Um, in fact, when, um, when O'Kane was going up, um, the excavated earth from O'Kane was used to smooth out and create that field. And it's really an example of how the sport of baseball um, at the turn of the century in the 1890s and the early 1900s was truly becoming our nation's pastime and was becoming very popular as an intercollegiate sport. Um, and Holy Cross was right at the start of that. Um, so almost a little over a decade before Fit and Field um, opened its gates, there actually was a very vibrant um, athletic culture and a very important baseball field at Holy Cross. And here's a cool photo. I want to credit the college archives. Um, this is a photo of that baseball field. Um, this was taken at the first intercollegiate game on campus. It's 1893. Um, and it's Holy Cross versus Georgetown. Um, we don't know who won that game, um, but I think common sense could tell us that Holy Cross more likely than not probably won. Um, but this was the first baseball field on campus and someone like Louis Sokalexis, the famous Holy Cross baseball player um, who uh, was a student athlete at Holy Cross for two years before transferring to Notre Dame. This would have been the field that he and, uh, and his contemporaries played at well over a decade before Fit and Field opened its gates. And, and Louis Sokalexis um, went on to become a professional baseball player. Um, he was a Native American, um, again, played for two years for Holy Cross, but he never would have known Fit and Field. This would have been his home um, during his two years at Holy Cross. Moving a little bit more up the hill, um, Kimball. You can't be a Holy Cross student and not spend a good amount of time in this building. The central dining hall on campus. Um, Kimball opened its doors in 1935. Really um, the only significant construction project during the, the depression years. Um, it, it opened to a seating capacity of 900, which at the time was one of the largest dining halls in the country. And even today, it's still one of the largest 
um, on the East Coast, definitely in the Northeast. Um, and when, when it was opened, um, original dining um, was family style with student waiters, um, a very different style. And that was pretty much the, uh, the, the dining norm um, for, for the first 40 years of its existence. In 1971, um, the college switched to the more contemporary cafeteria-style dining. Um, so student waiters kind of went by the wayside. I mean, there are still students who, who have work study in Kimball. I worked my four years in that building. Um, but there's one thing about Kimball that I really want to point out, um, and it's, it's the tables. It's the tables. Um, the tables have never changed. Um, so those 12-foot or seven-foot tables, there's 86 of them in, in total, um, are the same original tables that were put in there when the building was open. So, um, you know, the room itself has undergone a facelift. The chairs have been replaced. The tapestry has been replaced. The lighting has undergone some sprucing up but the tables are still the same. So many generations of students and their families and their parents and their grandparents have all shared the same dining table for the last 85 years. Um, so Father Kay liked to point out that this is something very tangible that is hidden in, in plain sight. We, we kind of take it for granted. Um, but I did want to point that out. And for, for anyone who's a, uh, a Harry Potter fan. I know when I was touring campus and, and when I give tours, um, you know, a lot of people walk into Kimball and they think, wow, this, this kind of reminds me of the great hall at Hogwarts. And it still really has that feel to it, um, even 85 years later. Um, the photo on the, on the left, again, taken in the early 60s, you can see some of the student waiters wearing white. Um, and obviously the photos on the, on the right are a little bit more contemporary, um, but the same dining um, surface has, has not changed. So that's something that um, current and, and past generations of crusaders get to experience. All right, so moving from um, Kimball Quad to probably the most iconic building on campus, um, you know, this is very visible on our website. Um, it's certainly visible on any admissions brochures. It's, uh, it's Fenwick Hall and kind of its iconic um, spires kind of looming into the Worcester sky. Um, this building, as we see it today, is very, very different than how it looked in the early days of Holy Cross. Um, and this is what Fenwick was. So this is what we see today. This is the original building. This, this sketching is from about 1845. So say two years after Fenwick um, opened its doors, after Holy Cross was established. Um, it, it, construction on the building began right away. Um, once Holy Cross um, got the approval from, from, from the Jesuit order, um, and in its first incarnation, the building housed nearly everything. Um, students um, resided here. Faculty, Jesuits resided here. Classes were held here. The chapel was here. Laboratories were here. This was kind of the central hub of campus. There were other buildings. There were other kind of small farm houses and barns and things like that. Um, but this three-story building was Holy Cross in those early years. So you can imagine when the fire devastated the building um, in 1852, so a little less, than a, little less than a decade after Holy Cross was established, about three years after the first graduating class entered the, uh, the world, um, Fenwick was burnt essentially to the ground. Um, and there was serious consideration as to whether Holy Cross could have a, a second life. Um, you know, there were Jesuit um, leaders, not only in the US, but in Rome, who thought, well, maybe 
maybe we can try something else. That was around the time when um, Loyola, Maryland was, was being built and there was some thought, well, maybe the, the Holy Cross Jesuits and teachers can be shipped down there to Baltimore. Uh, but fortunately, um, thank God, um, the college got a second life and, uh, and, and uh, a rebuilt Fenwick took place shortly after the fire. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about the man on the, on the right, um, Bishop Benedict Joseph Fenwick, our founder of Holy Cross. Um, who was he? He was the second Bishop of Boston. Um, he was a Jesuit. Um, and he purchased the land that became Holy Cross from Father Fitton in 1843. Um, now, why did he do that? Um, you know, here you have the Bishop of Boston. Why would he purchase land roughly 40 miles west to build a college? Um, and the reason he did it was threefold. Number one, back then, kind of the jurisdiction of what today we refer to as the Archdiocese of Boston had a very large geographic sweep. So central Massachusetts would have been in Bishop Fenwick's purview. Um, second of all, there were strong anti-Catholic tensions in Boston at the time. Um, and the physical remoteness of Worcester was attractive to Bishop Fenwick. Um, in fact, in 1834, so about nine years before he started Holy Cross, a convent school run by Ursuline sisters in Charlestown, just outside Boston, was burned to the ground by an anti-Catholic mob. Um, this devastated Bishop Fenwick and it really hit close to home because when he was elevated to the Bishop position, one of his first major projects was relocating that convent school to its Charlestown spot. And to see it get torched devastated him and he did not wanna see that happen again, which is why a Worcester location for a potential school was attractive. And then number two, um, Worcester itself was growing. Um, in, the, in the 20 years or so before the Civil War, so roughly from the 1840s to the 1860s, Worcester's population grew from about 7,500 to over 25,000. And that was spurred primarily by the opening of the Blackstone Canal. You know, we talked about um, the Blackstone River and its importance in the Industrial Revolution. Um, and also Worcester's geographic location in the center of Massachusetts, right on the intersection of railroad lines connecting Boston, Springfield, and New York City. Um, the jobs were, were becoming um, abundant and it was attracting a lot of immigrants particularly a lot of Irish immigrants working on the canals um, and also working on the railroads. And the, the ability to create a school, um, a Catholic school for Catholic men and boys was very attractive to Bishop Fenwick. And, and those were the reasons why he ultimately kind of looked beyond Boston um, and, and established Holy Cross where he did. And some people have asked, well, where did we get the name? You know, why didn't he name it Fenwick Academy or Fenwick University? Um, we are named after his cathedral in Boston, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. That's how we get our name, which is a little unique. Um, you know, amongst um, Jesuit schools in the US, um, at least universities, they're named either from their locale. Think of a Boston College or think of a Santa Clara University or a, a University of San Francisco, or they're named after um, uh, saints or Jesuit leaders. So think of Xavier University or Loyola of Maryland, um, schools like that. So our name is a little unique, um, but the reason Bishop Fenwick chose it was to uh, really honor his kind of seat, um, the cathedral in Boston, um, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. So that's how we got our name. Um, now, after the fire of 1852 and the kind of reconstruction of Fenwick, um, the reconstruction took place in phases. And you can actually 
see those phases as you walk past the building today. Um, so a few months to maybe about a year after the fire of 52, construction began on kind of a second version, Fenwick 2.0, if you will. Um, and it was a three-story building. Um, and then in the 1860s, about 10 to 15 years later, um, a fourth floor was added along with the iconic spires that we see today. Um, so if you walk past Fenwick, you can actually visually kind of see the different iterations of the new version. Um, you see a, white, see a white line right here. Anything below that white line was built um, shortly after the fire. So 1853, 1854. And we, we think, historians think, that um, this was roughly the height of the original Fenwick before it went up in flames. And you can kind of see that anything below that white line, anything above the white line, so the fourth floor and the spires um, was built afterwards. So Fenwick is an example of a work in progress. Um, it, was, it was built in stages over time and it kind of became the building that it is today. One thing that I do want to point out that is very um, unique about Fenwick um, and very iconic is commencement porch. Um, and this is another image of that. Um, commencement porch, which uh, Holy Cross graduations took place there um, essentially until the Second World War. Um, here's a picture from the commencement exercises in 1923. Um, you know, not only were commencements held there, um, but many large campus outdoor gatherings. Um, and it was huge. It was very spacious. Um, but, um, and this is an example of kind of how things change over time, how needs change over time. Um, shortly after the, uh, the First World War, when the college realized with, with rising enrollment that it needed a dedicated chapel um, and, and construction started for what became known as St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. Um, the Jesuit leaders of the campus wanted that building to be the spiritual and the religious hub of Holy Cross. Um, they wanted it to be grand. They wanted it to, um, you know, really like shout to the world how proud um, the college was of its Catholic roots. Um, but there was a problem. The main entrance to campus was on Linden Lane. And as one entered campus and went up Linden Lane, um, you know, you'd see this marvelous building, but it would be blocked. And it would be blocked by commencement porch um, because Commencement porch prior to St. Joseph's Chapel was another 35 to 40 feet in length. Um, so it essentially would have blocked this great ornate grandiose building. Um, so as the, uh, the construction workers um, were, 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 were building um, the chapel, um, there was also a massive um, restoration going on of, uh, of commencement porch. The, um, the stairs, which kind of jutted straight out, as you can see in the photo from 1923, were changed. They became a spiral staircase or wrapping up to the, um, or wrapping up to the porch on the sides. And then the porch itself was reduced um, by about 30 or 40 feet. So that once the chapel was built and was finished, um, you know, the Jesuit administrators got that big, grandiose entrance um, to, to the chapel. So now as you uh, drive onto Linden Lane and park your car and kind of walk around, you kind of see this, um, this, this very impressive entryway um, to the chapel. And, um, and Commencement Porch was kind of a, uh, a casualty of that, so to speak. But the new iteration of it um, is, is certainly beautiful, certainly beautiful. Um, Another thing about Fenwick that I do like to point out that, that, that a lot of people often ask on tours is, is it true that there is a um, exorcism room on campus? You know, what's the, what's the deal with the exorcism room? Um, there is a room on the west wing um, of the building, kind of the part of the building that abuts 
um, O'Kane Hall. Um, on the fourth floor, there are these stairs that go to a very mysterious fifth floor, kind of stairs to nowhere, as you will. Um, and etched on the door, you might see the, the, the number 666 or some other things. And, and over the decades, legends and rumors have persisted um, that this was an exorcism room. Um, and, you know, Father K in his research, though he tried, um, couldn't find any um, written documents um, stating that that room was used for anything but storage, which it is currently used for by both the admissions department and the uh, classics department, um, or excuse me, the advancement department, my department, um, and the, the classics department. Um, but, you know, Father K didn't, didn't um, refute um, and, and he didn't affirm whether exorcisms did take place on campus. So certainly the legend persists, but as far as we know, there is no written documentation of exorcisms or other kind of paranormal activity taking place either in Fenwick or maybe the O'Kane clock tower um, or in the basement of Dynan, but it certainly makes for a very fun kind of spooky legend that certainly persists to this day. Um, but one thing that I can tell you about Fenwick that is true is the great bell caper. And this is very much true. Um, you know, you think of, you know, the Muppets and the great Muppet caper. This is kind of along those lines. Um, the Fenwick bell, um, when shortly after the fire in 1852, um, the Jesuits had a 400 pound copper bell cast at the foundry, the Boston area foundry, formerly owned by, believe it or not, Paul Revere. And a year later, that bell was mounted on the top of Fenwick Hall. And over the subsequent decades, really became the timekeeper of, of the campus. Um, the bell would ring and that would tell you when students needed to wake up, when they needed to go to bed, when it was time for study, when it was time for classes. Um, when it was time to eat, the bell was really the timepiece of the campus. Um, you know, as we entered into the 20th century, the bell became less and less important, um, but was still kept nonetheless, until early in Father Brooks's administration as president, um, he and a few other campus leaders decided, well, we understand the historic significance of the bell, if you will. Um, but practically, we, we don't need it. And, and, and honestly, they were getting tired of one too many Holy Cross pranksters scaling um, Fenwick Tower in the night trying to ring it. Um, so in 1974, the bell was removed from its place on top of Fenwick Hall and kind of placed in a, you could say a quasi memorial spot um, around the corner, right in front of O'Kane, right at the top of Linden Lane. There was a nice little plaque put there, talked a little bit about the history of the bell. Um, and it was nice. It was kind of our own version of the Liberty Bell, so to speak. Um, you know, visitors to campus could see it, could read a little bit about its history and, and, and go on with their day. Um, and there the bell sat for about another 30 or so years um, until April of 2009. So 11 years ago this month, the bell mysteriously disappeared and nobody knows where. Um, truth be told, it wasn't stolen in the middle of the night. It wasn't a, an ornate caper. Um, the bell was stolen in broad daylight. Um, I believe it was during a weekday. Um, seemingly movers arrived on campus um, in a big truck. They unscrewed the bell. They carefully placed it in their truck and then they drove away. And I think most people just assumed, well, um, it's, it's undergoing refurbishing or whatnot. Nope, they weren't, uh, they weren't maintenance workers, they were thieves, um, and the bell has never been seen again. Some people speculate that maybe it was melted down and, and its copper was then sold on the black market. Who knows, maybe uh, it's in the back warehouse somewhere um, and we'll be reunited with it. But there was never a note left. There was never a ransom note or anything like that. Um, but 
um, it is a very interesting caper. And even today, as you walk around campus, you kind of see the sad remnant of it. It's in the lower right-hand side of the screen. Um, and, and Father Kay often said, hey, this might make for a nice class gift down the, down the road to kind of replace the, the missing bell. Um, but that is, you know, we, we, can't, we can't verify exorcisms, but we definitely know that there are bell capers taking place on campus. That is truth, truth be told. Um, around, the can around the corner from where the bell was, was lifted is Dine-In Library. Um, it opened its doors in 1927. It was part of what then was called the Million Dollar Campaign. It was kind of a capital campaign um, to build um, different structures on campus to respond to the rising enrollment after the First World War. Dine-In was one of those buildings. A beautiful, beautiful um, space. In fact, I remember going on my tour and my mother just being blown away by the reading room um, and walking into there and looking up at the ceiling and just being, uh, just having her breath taken away. And it's, it's magnificent. Um, but there's something about dining that I do like to point out, and that is it's home to the college's archives and special collections. And they, in turn, are home to some very rare and very unusual publications, artwork, and especially artifacts. And, and one of my favorites is a picture of the one on the right. Um, Holy Cross has a mummy on campus. That is truth. Um, it's a 2,500 year old Egyptian mummy and it's sarcophagus. Um, it's, about a, it's about a 29 inch mummy of a young girl. Um, her name, um, is called Tanit Panakau, probably butchering it, Tanit pa Paakau. Um, it, it's translated daughter of the magic god. Um, and the mummy was gifted to Holy Cross in 1896 by an alumnus, Peter Skelly. Um, so it's been in our possession ever since. Um, no one really knows how Mr. Skelly got the mummy in his possession, um, but now it's, it's part of the college's archives. It's, it's occasionally placed on display. Um, so if you're on campus for a reunion or a homecoming, stop by Dine and Library. You might get to see and experience our, our own mummy. Um, the mummy itself is wrapped in brown linen um, and then in turn is covered with a, a ceramic bead structure um, the sarcophagus is a wooden sarcophagus painted all different colors with, with hieroglyphics on it as well. Um, and in the early 2000s, so around when, when I was an undergraduate, um, the mummy was restored because it was getting a little dilapidated um, and there was some concerns about its kind of long-term health. Um, so it was restored. Um, and during that restoration, conservators believe that the girl's death was around the year 650 BC, 650 BC. So that probably makes this mummy the oldest object on the Holy Cross campus. I think we can comfortably say that, um, but it's something really fun. Um, and, and I wanna do a shout out to alumnus Mike Kearney. Um, I hope he's on, um, he's class of 72. He reached out to me over the weekend and he asked, about the mummy, and I, I thought it was such a cool story, so I told him I would put it into this presentation, our, our own Holy Cross mummy. Um, here's a building that is just breathtaking, um, St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. It, it, it opened its doors in 1924. In addition to Dine and Library, um, the chapel was part of that million dollar campaign that took place in the early to mid 1920s. Um, and it was built because of A, growing enrollment at the college, and B, a need to have a dedicated chapel space for the campus community. Up until then, um, there was a main chapel in Fenwick Hall. Um, there were a few kind of ancillary chapels, one I believe in an alumni hall and a few scattered elsewhere. But the thought was we need a central place of worship on campus that was worthy of, of Holy Cross. Um, and, and the chapel, um, St. Joseph Chapel, is, is the result of that, um, of that work. 
um, its 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 architect was a man by the name of Charles McGinnis, um, who did a lot of other buildings on campus, including Wheeler and alumni, um, and Dine and Library. Um, but the architect, Mr. McGinnis, built St. Joseph Chapel in a style called Renaissance Revival, and it's it's a it's a style that was very um, popular in the uh, in, in the late 16th century for Jesuit institutions, um, and and that served as a model for Mr. McGinnis as he was designing St. Joseph Chapel. And one of the biggest sources of inspiration for him um, was the Jesuit mother church in Rome, the Jesu. Um, the, the, the Jesu in Rome, the facade has very striking similarities to our St. Joseph Chapel. And, and, and the reason for that again is to, is to hearken back to the Jesuit connections of Holy Cross and the Jesuit heritage. Um, and St. Joseph's is built along those same architectural styles. Um, so if you're in Rome and you're walking past the Jesu, um, you know, you've got a little piece of Holy Cross with you as well. Um, now the chapel inside is just breathtaking. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, you know, you can understand why um, during some of the key wedding months in the spring, summer, and fall, there could be a little bit of a wait list. Um, the chapel is just absolutely gorgeous. As I said, it opened its doors in 1924. Um, the total cost was about $300,000, which, um, you know, is the equivalent of about five or six million dollars today. So Father Kuznetsky would often say it was a pretty good deal back then um, to have it built. Um, but the Jesuits actually ran out of money um, when, when, the, uh, when the chapel was built. Um, so when it, when it opened its doors, its original windows were clear glass. And it wasn't until two years later in 1926 that the stained glass was, was added. But it certainly um, adds to the beauty and the grandeur of the space. Um, and like most churches, um, the stained glass tells a story, um, and Holy Cross is no different. I like to show this, um, this map. Um, I want to credit um, Professor Virginia Regan, um, who is a uh, Holy Cross faculty member in the uh, visual arts department. Um, she created this map, which kind of shows um, the stained glass. So I'll just go back in the slides one. You can see the map. Um, all, the, all the images on the left-hand side, so this is entering the chapel in the back, kind of facing the altar. Um, all the images in the, uh, on the, uh, the left-hand side represent scholars or doctors of the church um, to symbolize um, kind of the, the, the church's placing on an institution of higher learning. Um, and then all the images on the right represent martyrs um, because the church's name is St. Joseph Memorial Chapel, um, a memorial to all Holy Cross alumni who lost their life in, in um, war service. Um, and it's a very American kind of iconography of relating, um, giving one's life for one's country um, for, for freedom um, and to equate that with giving one's life for one's faith, for, for something larger than oneself. Um, so that's the reason for the choice of the, uh, of the stained glass. You've got the scholars on the left, you've got the martyrs on the right. And here's a, here's a close up. Um, you see St. Ignatius of Loyola um, considered one of, the, um, one of the scholars, the founder of the Society of Jesus. And then you've got on, on the right, Mary, Queen of Martyrs. Um, and you've got a beautiful image at the bottom, um, kind of the Pieta image of Mary cradling um, Jesus at the foot of the cross. Um, you know, if, if you're on campus and, and you have some time to walk around, poking into St. Joseph Chapel and just looking at the stained glass is certainly worth your time. They were renovated maybe about a decade ago. 
um, the colors are just breathtaking. Um, and they certainly are, certainly are, a, are a, a strong hallmark of, of the space and of, of the campus in general. And when you leave the camp, when, when you leave the chapel, this is something unique. Um, not many campuses in America have a cemetery. We do. Um, it's kind of nestled just, just outside the chapel. And when I was a student, my freshman and sophomore year, I lived in Hanselman and I lived in Clark. I would oftentimes cut through the cemetery on my way to Kimball or on my way to class. And I always assumed that all the headstones were of Jesuits um, who were either teachers or administrators on campus. That's not necessarily true. Um, that in actuality, contrary to popular belief, not everyone buried in the cemetery was a member of the college's faculty or the college's Jesuit cemetery. Um, for about 100 years, from about the mid 1800s till 1939, Believe it or not, Holy Cross was home to one of the only Jesuit cemeteries in the East. So any Boston area, any New England area Jesuit who passed away was probably buried here on campus. It wasn't until 1939 um, when the West End Jesuit Center in, we uh, the, excuse me, the Campion Jesuit Center in Weston, Massachusetts was opened right outside Boston that that began to change, that any New England or Boston area Jesuit after 1939 was then buried at Campion in Weston um, and, and Holy Cross um, stayed um, and, and, and really just men who had a connection to the school. So that's why um, when he passed away in um, 2012, Father Brooks was buried on campus because of his connection to Holy Cross. Or more recently, when Father Kuznevsky passed away in 2016, he was buried on campus because of his connection to Holy Cross. Um, now, many of the Jesuits buried in the cemetery uh, were veterans, and there's a flag at each of their headstones. Um, and that in itself is a little bit of a, of a history lesson because the flag holders, the, the, the shape of the flag holder represent what um, what war they served in. Um, so anyone with a, with a star served in the Civil War. Believe that, the Civil War. Um, it just seems so long ago, but we have Jesuits um, who, who served in the Civil War. Um, if they have a cross, that represents the Spanish-American War, or a circle represents the Second World War. Um, and I included a photo on, on the bottom left um, this, this is, a, is a wonderful book. It, it actually was published this past summer. It's called Beneath the Cross, and it was published in celebration of the college's 175th anniversary. And it's a nice history, a nice guide of the cemetery. Um, and it was written by a woman by the name of Sarah Campbell, who's the college's assistant archivist in our archives and special collections. Um, and I definitely encourage you, if this is something that interests you, to pick up a copy of this book because it tells the story of the cemetery um, and it also really paints a picture of the, of the men and their, and their um, very interesting lives who are interred here on campus. All right, so now, I hope I haven't lost you. I want to... I want to ask another question, if you can see this. Another pop quiz. Um, take some time to fill it out, if you can. What is the oldest building currently on campus? What is the oldest building currently on campus? I'll leave this up for a, a few more minutes, a few more seconds. Um, As you're going fast and furious. What's the oldest building currently on campus? All right, I'll give you another five seconds or so. Best guess, and again, these aren't graded. We're not gonna revoke your degree. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. All right, we got some 
Hopefully you can see this. All right. 43% of you say the old campus bakery. 27% of you say Campion House. Well, I got to say the majority rules. You are right. The old campus bakery is the oldest building currently on campus. Um, there's a picture of it. Um, it was built around the mid 1800s, around the time of the original Fenwick Hall. Um, and um, that was where all baking and cooking took place. It was deliberately built, removed from Fenwick, um, Fenwick Hall, because of you know, just the real fear of fire in those days. So they wanted to keep all their cooking and all their, all their open flames physically removed. That's why it's located on the hill, on the hillside, kind of right next to the current Smith Hall um, and, and the, the campus greenhouse on its other side. Um, it was around the turn of the century. So right around 1906, 1907, um, the, the bakery was deemed obsolete. It was shut down um, and it was moved inside into Fenwick Hall. Um, so it still exists today. Um, in fact, the, uh, the campus building and grounds crew uses it for storage. So if you were to pry open that door, you might see bags of mulch, you might see some hose and some rakes. Um, you know, if, if, if anyone is a, um, is a fan of J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, to me, it kind of looks like a little bit of a hobbit house, like a, uh, like a Bilbo Baggins is gonna walk out of the, walk out of the front door. Um, you know, I often thought that this would make for a nice coffee house on campus, um, you know, like the Hobbit House or something like that. Um, but contrary to some popular belief, um, Campion House is not the oldest building. One of, but not the oldest. Um, it was built around 1906, 1907. Um, originally, the residence for farm workers um, who were tending the campus orchard or the campus dairy herd. Um, and over time, it's been used for a variety of things, a Jesuit residence, a pizza house, um, a coffee shop. It's the current home of the college office of the, of the chaplains. Um, and Father Kuznevsky often said that he believes the, the structure of the building is a very loose reconstruction of what was called Mount St. James Seminary, which was a small school um, operated by Father Fitton prior to selling the land to Bishop Fenwick. Um, Father Kuznevsky seems to think that it might be a loose reconstruction of that. Um, that building was eventually torn down and then Fenwick Hall was built in its spot. Um, but it is, a, it is a campus gym nestled right on the hill. All right, we're coming to the home stretch, um, kind of working our way up the hill, easy street. You know, many a Holy Cross student have, have walked these paths. It's, it's affectionately referred to as easy street um, because it's one of the only flat continuous spots on campus. Um, all the hill dorms around easy street um, were built shortly after the second world war, um, a result of the growing um, enrollment boom um, with the baby boomers in that generation. Um, the, the, the first two dorms, Hanselman and Lehigh, were opened in the mid 50s. And then um, Healy, which we're looking at right now, and Clark were then opened in the early 60s. But there's one thing about these dorms that I do want to point out and is very much hidden in plain sight are these statues. Each of those four dorms, with the exception of Brooks Milady, um, has these statues, which I'll be honest, as a student, I walked past many a time. I just assumed, okay, maybe it was a former president of the school or whatnot, but they have significance. Um, they all represent Jesuit saints um, who for some reason were all connected to the first Jesuit college in Rome. Um, you know, Father Kuznevsky would speculate that, you know, maybe they were put there as an inspiration to current students um, who are in their studies, just as these men um, were, were students themselves in Rome. Um, at Healy Hall, and that's the image that you see on the left, Healy Hall has Robert Bellarmine, um, who went on to become a cardinal, a doctor of the church. Um, he's famously was embroiled in the Galileo controversy over whether the earth or the sun was the center of the solar system. Um, but the other three, John Birchman's at Lehigh, 
Stanislaus Casca and Hanselman and Aloysius Gonzaga at Clark, um, they all died very young. All three of them died in their early to mid twenties. Um, what is the significance of that? We, we don't know. Father Kuznetsky speculated that, um, you know, knowing that all three of them were canonized, they could serve as a, as a model, as a youthful model for the Holy Cross students of today, as something to strive for, someone they can relate to. Um, who knows? Um, but in, in today's COVID-19 pandemic and kind of the reality we are all in now, um, you know, saying a, saying a prayer to St. Ignatius Gonzaga uh, might be fitting. He, um, in addition to being the patron saint of Jesuit scholastics, he's also the, the, the patron saint of plague victims. He died very young in Rome, ministering um, to, to people suffering from the plague. Um, and the, the connections to today are, are pretty striking, pretty striking. Um, but this is an example of something that I would walk past all the time and, and, and not know, not know. I, I lived in many of these dorms um, and, and, and I just wanted to, to point those out to, to all of you. And then last, promise, this is it. Um, the Campus Arboretum. Um, on, on the bottom left, you'll see a, a dog tag, essentially. Many a Holy Cross tree is adorned with these little tags. In fact, on windy days, you can kind of hear this little click, click, clicking around campus. Um, and these are these dog tags. They represent um, the campus arboretum. Um, you know, I found this very interesting poem um, attributed to Father Earls. He was a professor of English in the early 1900s. I found this poem in the uh, most recent edition of the campus arboretum book. Um, which comes out every decade or so. Um, but there's many trees. In fact, 700 trees on campus have one of these little tags. Um, and it was during Father Brooks's administration in 1983 um, that the decision was made to make Holy Cross an arboretum, a place where a variety of trees and shrubs are grown for study and display. At the time, in 1983, there were about 800 trees and shrubs scattered throughout campus. Today, there are over 6,000, I'll say that again, over 6,000 trees representing 115 different varieties. Um, and many of the tags list information that, like I said, correlates to that, uh, that accompanying Arboretum book, but there's a few um, that represent important moments in the college's history. And one of which is the Teddy Roosevelt tree. That Teddy Roosevelt, the sitting president at the time, visited Holy Cross in 1905 to deliver the commencement address. And shortly after that, he planted this Scotch elm on the lower part of campus, um, right near the present day tennis courts, overlooking the baseball field. Um, if you're walking to a football game, you, you no doubt have passed this um, Scotch Elm. The photo on the, on the uh, left was taken maybe about 20 years or so ago, um, just showing some maintenance work on that tree. But this is a strong example of something hidden in plain sight. Um, you know, whether you've walked past that tree, whether you recognize that tree or not, I'm guessing that many of you have seen this tree in a different way and never even knew it. And it's here. Do you recognize this image? This is a famous image from 1939, Ted Williams is first at bat, um, April 14th of 39. Um, the 20 year old Ted Williams, brand new member of the Boston Red Sox, um, his first true at bat, supposedly he hit a home run. Um, the Red Sox were in town to scrimmage Holy Cross. They played a game on Fit and Field and this kind of became an iconic photograph taken. You can clearly tell it's Holy Cross with O'Kane in the distance, but one of these trees is the Teddy Roosevelt tree. Um, one of these trees has been memorialized in this very famous picture. Um, so I wanted to close with this to really demonstrate how things are hidden 
in plain sight and how things are connected um, and how the history of our beloved Holy Cross is so rich and so strong. Um, and for that, I will, I will pause and I know we're up against the hour. Um, if anyone is interested, I'm happy to stay on for another, say, 10 minutes or so to, to answer some questions. Um, but I just want to thank you for your attention. I think we had close to 300 participants in this, uh, in this webinar. It was a lot of fun. I hope you found it fun. And who knows, maybe we can, we can do more of these um, in the future. So for that, I'm going to pull up the questions and just kind of see what might be on your mind. All right. And again, I'm going to I'm going to stick around till probably about 12, 1 15 or so, um, and try to answer some of your questions if you're game. If you can't join us, um, you know, thank you again for for being a part of this. All right. Let's see. We got some really good questions. Um, I've got one here that asks, are there hidden passages on campus? Um, and did Holy Cross play a role in the Underground Railroad? Um, I've heard those legends. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that there is any historical evidence that Holy Cross was in fact a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, you know, this is an example of, of along the lines of the exorcism room. You know, we can't affirm, we can't deny, um, but as far as we can tell, there's no um, written documentation of, of, of Holy Cross serving in that capacity. As for the hidden um, tunnels, um, at one point, Kimball was used as the central power plant for the campus. Um, so there are a series of smaller type tunnels that might, um, you know, carry steam and, and, other, and other things to centrally to, to Kimball. But as far as I know, there aren't kind of these secret passages where, um, you know, maybe exorcisms took place or where Jesuits can scurry from one part of the campus to another. Um, I, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, I do know that at one point, Father Brooks said that, this is when the Jesuits were living in Loyola, that there was some talk about creating a tunnel from Loyola to the chapel, so that in, in, in increment weather, they could kind of get from one to the other, but that, that never came to pass. But that's kind of the closest that I've ever heard of, um, of potential tunnels actually in use. Um, you know, there's another question. Can you talk a little bit about the Irish Catholic discrimination against the college in its early years? Um, probably the best example I can give to that is our charter. Um, you know, we were, we were founded in 1843. Our first graduating class wasn't until 1849. Um, and our, for about 20 years or so, um, Holy Cross graduates didn't receive Holy Cross degrees because um, the school couldn't receive a, a charter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, you know, there, there could be a variety of factors. Um, you know, some of it is, is very true that there was um, Catholic bias um, against Holy Cross. You know, the state will claim um, you know, that they had too many, um, they had too many charters going on and, and they just couldn't, they, they couldn't make a, make a rationale for, for adding a new one. Um, who knows, who knows, but it wasn't until 1865, so around the time of the end of the Civil War, that the college officially received its, its charter. So for those first, what would that be, first 14 graduating classes or so, technically they receive Georgetown diplomas. Um, so that's a very um, tangible um, example of, of Catholic discrimination against the college in its early years. Um, there was a question about 
um, the, the basketball barn. You know, if anyone is, is a fan of Holy Cross athletics, um, you've heard of how the uh, 1947 team that won the NCAA tournament, the team that featured um, George Kafton or Bob Cousy, um, how they had to practice in a barn. And there's some, there's some truth to that. Um, you now, as, as we were talking about baseball and football, you know, basketball kind of became more popular a little bit later on. Um, an indoor practice space for Holy Cross in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s was was limited. You know, there was a there was a gymnasium tucked away in the back of O'Kane, but that wouldn't necessarily serve as a place for for basketball to be practiced. Um, so there was an old barn roughly behind where where the chapel is. So if you're if you're looking at the screen in front of you, roughly right behind the chapel, there was an old barn that was kind of reconfigured um, into a practice facility. But my understanding is that the dimensions were very tight. So if someone was aggressively going for a loose ball, they kind of took their life into their hands because they might come smack with the, uh, with, with the wall. Um, those early teams, especially the, uh, the 47 championship team, um, they played their home games across town. They played them at South High School in Worcester, at the Boston Arena, or at the Boston Garden. We, we didn't have a, uh, uh, an indoor arena, so to speak. We had fit and field, you know, that would serve track, that would serve baseball, that would serve football, but, but basketball, we just didn't have a facility um, until later in the 20th century. Um, so let me see. Besides President Roosevelt, and President Johnson, have any other sitting presidents visited Holy Cross? Um, well, we talked about Teddy Roosevelt, gave the commencement address in 1905. Um, um, Lyndon B. Johnson did the same in 1964, um, delivered the commencement address. Um, as far as we know, no sitting US presidents have visited Holy Cross. Um, you know, it's my understanding that um, I think in 1912, um, Woodrow Wilson visited the campus um, early in the, uh, in the presidential election of that year. Um, I know that Al Smith, then governor of New York in the 1920s, visited Holy Cross. What's, what's interesting about Al Smith is um, he ran for president in 1928 um, as the first Catholic on a major ticket. Um, he lost in a landslide to Herbert Hoover. Um, so maybe he visited campus because of that Catholic connection. Um, and I don't know of any sitting presidents. You know, I know that um, Mother Teresa um, received an honorary degree in the 1970s. Believe it or not, Harry Houdini, the magician, visited campus in the 1920s. Um, you know, the who, the musical group famously performed in the field house in 1969. Uh, Martin Luther King visited campus in the early 60s. So we've had some very distinguished visitors and guests. Um, oh, I believe um, Eamon uh, de Valera. I don't know if at the time he was president of Ireland, um, but he was definitely in charge of Sinn Féin. I know he visited campus in the 1920s. Um, but besides Roosevelt and Johnson, I, uh, I don't know of any other um, sitting presidents who visited. The interesting story about Johnson is um, President Kennedy actually accepted the invitation to deliver the commencement address um, in the fall of 63. Well, after his assassination, um, the Johnson administration kept that promise. They didn't have any obligation to, but they kept that promise. And, um, and as a result, he, he addressed the graduates in the spring of 64. And I know that um, that gesture really enamored him and his administration with, with Holy Cross and with central Massachusetts. You got to figure like this was staunch Kennedy territory, um, but him coming to Worcester and, and kind of honoring the late president's commitment, um, you know, went a long way, definitely went a long way. Um, let me see, I wanna be conscious of people's time. Um, let's see. 
Um, Wheeler, we got some questions about Wheeler. Um, Wheeler Hall, which I, I apologize, we just didn't have time to get to everything. Um, Wheeler Hall opened its doors, I wanna say in like 1940, right, right at the beginning of the Second World War. Um, the architect who designed Wheeler was the same guy who did um, dine in in the chapel. He kind of had a monopoly on big Holy Cross construction projects, Charles McGinnis. Um, but the thing about Wheeler is the way it's oriented, um, it kind of has an east-west axis on the side of the hill. Um, so the, the, the student rooms either face to the north or to the south. Um, and I know that when the early plans of Wheeler um, were, were being put together, um, you know, some of the Jesuit leaders, not on campus, but in Rome, this kind of shows you how bureaucratic decisions were back then. Like any campus project on a small hill in Worcester had to be vetted through Rome. Um, but some of the, some of the Jesuit higher ups felt that the way the building was oriented was a little odd because half of the rooms would get very little sunlight by facing the north. Um, and I don't know if he was comfortable with Holy Cross or whatnot, um, but I know that the architect basically, um, basically said, well, you get what you get or, 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 I'm, or you don't get me. Um, and maybe this is an example of, you know, you ask forgiveness rather than permission. Um, so yeah, that's how Wheeler was built. And that's why kind of Wheeler Beach um, is oriented the way it is, kind of facing what was the old field house um, and then on that east-west axis with the rooms facing either north or the south. Um, and maybe we have room, maybe we have time for, for one, one more, I think one more question. Um, and this is, can you talk a little bit about the farmland uh, in those early days of campus? And I can definitely do that, but I'm gonna go, let's see. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back because I want to pull up. Okay. If you can see this, this is that aerial view of campus from um, roughly 1918. Um, and then I can do this fancy. Hopefully this works. You can do this like cool laser pointer. So you can see like this little red laser. Um, so this was taken around 1918-ish. Um, you can see the Blackstone River here. Um, this was before that million dollar construction project. So before Dianin, before Carlin, before um, St. Joseph Chapel. But right here, if you look right here, near the present day site of where um, Hogan, the Hogan Campus Center is, um, that was a, um, a garden where either potatoes or summer squash or um, other type of beans or products were, were cultivated. I mean, Holy Cross in those first few decades um, was very much an agricultural campus um, where students would you know, learn the ratio studiorum. They would become proficient in Greek and Latin. Um, they would learn about their theology um, but then they would also be expected to till the land. And, um, you know, Holy Cross had a very thriving orchard. Um, we had a, a dairy farm that produced milk, that produced butter. Um, a lot of that created commodity for the campus to then sell as a source of income. Um, so, so, yes, we definitely had a very strong um, agrarian kind of uh, history to us. And, um, you know, without having specific images to really illustrate that, I thought that this aerial would be a good one. Right here, right where the Hogan Campus Center is, you can kind of see the layout of a, uh, of a garden. And, and that's, and I mean, that was as late as 1918, um, right around the time of the First World War. So, um, you know, it wasn't until maybe the middle part of the 20th century that we kind of de-emphasize um, the, the farming and, and, and super emphasize the academics. Um, so with that, I know it's late. Um, I, I can't thank you enough, all of you, for your attention, for your support, 
um, you know, who knows, maybe we can, we can try to do this again in a different iteration. I recorded this, um, so God willing, I'll be able to uh, place it somewhere on the uh, alumni website um, and, and you can, can access it if you, if you so will. Um, but in the meantime, I, I, I wish you all well um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see, so, uh, see each other again very soon. Thank you for joining.